Hey church family, so glad to be with you today for Church at Home. Today we're kicking off our brand new series, Attacking Anxiety. It's all about how we can let God wage war on our worry. Anxiety is a prevalent issue in our society, and so I'm looking forward to talking about the tools that God gives us to fight against it. And speaking of that, one of the best tools we have at our disposal is our worship. So we're going to take a few moments to worship this morning and invite the Holy Spirit into this place. Would you pray with me? God, we are so grateful that you are a God that's with us. Lord, thank you that you are alongside us, even in moments where we feel anxious or we begin to worry. I pray that as we start this series, Lord, your presence would fall heavy on those that are watching wherever they are, Lord. Would they know that you are near, that you care for them? Thank you for being a God that is alongside us at every moment. Lord, right now, we just want to lift up your name. We want to glorify you, Lord, and in doing so, put ourselves in a position to receive what you have to say. I pray that you would inspire us. I pray that you would challenge us. I pray that you would spur us forward. Lord, we thank you so much, and we dedicate this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our fight is with weapons unseen Your enemies crash to their knees As we rise up in worship When trials unleash like a flood the battle belongs to our God As we cry out in worship The victory is yours You're riding on the storm Your name is unfailing Though rise and fall your throne withstands it all your name is unshaken what hell meant to break me has failed now nothing will silence my praise and will cry out in a word
has the victory. Well, church family, so glad to be with you for church today. If you're with us for the first time, we would love the chance to connect with you. You can do that by stopping by our welcome bar on your way out or by scanning the QR code in front of you. Both will give you the opportunity to learn more about the ways that you can get plugged in. And one new exciting opportunity that I want to tell you about is our brand new social media team. If you're a social media expert or are passionate about social media and using it as a tool to continue to further the mission here at Captivate, we would love to partner together. You can sign up for our social media team by clicking connect with Captivate when you scan the QR code in your seat back or by emailing info at CaptivateSD.com. Also excited to let you know that today we are launching our brand new weekly game plan. The game plan is how you take what you learned in church and make it real in your life. It has takeaways from today's message, Devo questions for the week, as well as a weekly challenge that will help you put God's word into practice. Pick up your game plan by the doors on your way out or download it online at CaptivateSD.com. And finally, just want to remind you that you can continue to support the work that God is doing here at Captivate through your generosity. You can give online at CaptivateSD.com or in the black giving boxes on your way out. Thank you so much for being so faithful in your giving. We could not do it without you. Again, I'm so glad you're with us this morning. We hope that this message blesses and encourages you. What is up, everybody? I'm so glad you're with us today because we're starting a brand new series, a series that I think is relevant to all of us. It's called Attacking Anxiety. Attacking Anxiety. And we were going to do this series last March, actually, but something really crazy happened in the world. I don't know if you heard about it, all right? And just like everybody else, we had to pivot, we had to change, we had to go with the flow. And so we didn't do this series, but we knew we wanted to because it's so relevant to everybody in our culture right now. And so maybe we've just had another year of anxiety that we get to talk about and now deal with. And as we jump into the series, I thought, man, I came up with all these statistics and articles and reports I read online. I thought, man, do you really need like stats uh, to prove to you that anxiety is on the rise in our culture? Probably not. I don't want to insult your intelligence. You just need a mirror, right, to see that uh, anxiety is on the rise because it happens in all of our lives. It just hits all of us. And yet there are still people who say, I'm too blessed to be stressed. You know anybody like that? How many of you hate those people? No, I'm just kidding. All right, we don't hate them, but it, it, it just, it happens to all of us, right? If your spouse doesn't ever stress you out, you've probably been married for seven minutes. Um, if your kids never stress you out, you probably don't spend enough time with them. If your friends never make you pull your hair out at some point, you probably don't know them very well. My friends know me well, and they're like, he's crazy, all right? He needs prayer, Help this guy out. The point is, anxiety is not uncommon. It's just kind of normal amongst people in our culture. Now, it's not normal in the sense that it's God's plan for your life. All right, that's not normal, but it's common. And so as we jump in, I don't want anybody feeling guilty or shameful because you deal with anxiety. I don't want you thinking that the people around you don't. All right, we all do on some level as much as we try to hide it or act like it's not there. I don't want you to think that a life with Jesus means you're never going to be anxious. In fact, the scriptures we're going to read today, we find it's quite the opposite. In fact, Jesus himself became very anxious, at least at one point in scripture. Jesus doesn't promise that you're never going to have anxiety. He didn't promise that you're never going to have pain. He promises to be with you in the middle of it, to train you how to go through it well, and he's going to be right there 
next to you. And so we need to start participating, I think, in this cultural mindset that's, that thinks, man, I'm going to get swole without getting sore first. The problem is we live in a culture that we like to post our swole days, not our sore days. But please know, whoever you follow, whoever you're close to, whoever you think's just uber successful, what comes with a beautiful package often is stress, it's anxiety, it's pain, it's struggle. We all go through it. Don't be shocked by stress. Again, not God's plan for your life. Scripture's really clear. It says all things were made for him and by him. In his presence is fullness and joy. Every person was made to rest and to delight in God. But the enemy, who's also real, his job is to get you away from that. He doesn't want you to rest in God at all. He wants you to be full of anxiety. And here's the way he does it. I think for most of us, he doesn't come to you, you know, to try to get you to think that God's not real or the Bible's not true or you shouldn't do good things for people. That's not what he does. He's too smart for that, right? He comes to you, and I think he says this. Hey, if you want to read the Bible, cool. If you want to go to church, Go for it. Um, just make sure you look good when you go and you meet the right person and you go on the right date and you make the right amount of money. And that might require that you went to the right college and you got the right degree and you got the right job, right? And then you meet the right person. But man, make sure you keep up on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and Tinder, except if you met her at church. Maybe you should get rid of that one. I don't know. And, and then you got to have the right proposal and the right wedding and the right amount of kids. Kids are expensive, right? You got diapers and health insurance and car insurance and braces and private school and public school. Do you have any friends? And then at some point, you're like, my kids are my friends. What happened to me? You know? Crazy. And all of a sudden, anxiety is produced. And I don't think in the middle of all that, we think God's dead. We kind of just lose him somewhere in there. That's a lot of stuff to worry about. Now, am I telling you that you should go live in the hillside somewhere and run away from problems and people? No, that's not what I'm saying. Why? Because often your problems are not even the problem. Um, we often think it's our anxiety that our problems is. We think that's the problem. That's a good start, but we're not there yet. Usually when it comes to the issues, the problems in our life, there's something actually deeper that's underlying that we must discover. And with that, let's go ahead and jump into our scripture for today. I'm going to be in 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter 5 is where we're going to be today, and this is really funny to me to read this scripture because Peter himself, he's one of the 12 disciples, he is the most anxious, stressed, triggered disciple of them all, and yet he's trying to write to us about how to deal with anxiety. <laughs> it's kind of funny. It's kind of funny, except what's happened at this point is God has done such a work in his life. He's learned so much about stress and anxiety that he actually wants to help us. The thing that he used to be kind of known for known for struggling with, he's now helping us with. And I love that God can do that in our life. Listen, God wants to take your greatest misery and turn it into your greatest ministry. The greatest places of pain that we have, and I know this is true for my life, the greatest pain points in my history and in my past, they become my greatest platforms, my greatest passions to help other people. Only God can do that. And so here's Peter. <laughs> He's a triggered, anxious guy. That's kind of what he's known for. I mean, at one point, he was so anxious that Jesus looked at him, called him Satan, and said, get behind me. <laughs> I mean, oh, if Jesus calls you Satan, that's a bad day. All right, we can erase that day. I'm not, I don't want to go back there. Let's erase that picture from my iPhotos. Like I'm, that's not fun, all right? And, and he used to deal with that, and God is conquering that in his life, and he's healing him, and now he wants to encourage us. Here's what he says. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6. He says this, humble yourself. That's important. We'll talk about it later. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Okay, verse 7, famous verse. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Right? And, and him saying to cast your anxiety, meaning he knows you have it. You don't need to feel bad for having it. He knows you're going to have it. He doesn't say cast all your sexual temptation on him. The Bible actually says in 1 Corinthians, just run away from that. Run from that. This, I want you to cast it on me because I care for you. Okay? You're probably going to have some anxiety in your life. He knows this. Why? Here's why. Because you have an enemy. Verse 8. In fact, be sober-minded. Be alert. Another translation says. Be watchful. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion. It says he's like a lion, and I love that language. Why? Because he's not actually a lion. He's just acting, all right? He has a mouth. He doesn't have any teeth. He can't defeat you. I mean, oh, we have the real lion. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. It's Jesus, right, in our hard situation. He just talks, and he talks a lot. In fact, he's seeking someone to devour. Verse 9, resist him. Firm in your faith, 
knowing that the same kind of suffering is being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. You're not the only one with anxiety, all right? Other people feel it too, even around the world, he says, verse 10. And after you've suffered a little while, after you've been a little bit anxious, all right, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself, he'll do this, he's going to restore you. I love it. You know, we've had a really hard year, and I've been thinking like, man, how do I restore what was? No, no, that's God's job. All right, God's going to restore you. He'll confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Is that good? I, that's all I needed today, man, was that scripture. We could pray out, and I would be good. It's good. Right? He's saying that you're going to have anxiety in your life. And if you have anxiety, it means something. It means that your enemy is close. And I think what Peter's saying is don't fight the anxiety, fight the enemy. Anxiety is not actually the problem. In fact, that's what I'm calling this first message in this series. Anxiety is not the problem. All right? Anxiety is not actually the problem. There's another problem. And speaking of anxiety, where I usually like to go when I have anxiety is the taco shop. Anybody in here today, you like Mexican food? Anybody? Come on, that's like asking if you like oxygen, right? That's a really easy question. I teed it up for you. Um, We're proud of our Mexican food here in San Diego. And I know we got people that watch from all over the place, other countries, other states, but we're proud of our Mexican food here in San Diego because it's amazing and, and we absolutely love it. And when I go to a taco shop, I normally order the same thing, but usually, you know, every now and then I, I get a craving. I start to crave something else. And I remember years ago, I asked a buddy of mine, I said, hey, um, I'm kind of craving something new. Is there a new taco shop you know about? And I was in college at the time, we were in class, and he said, oh yeah, there's this taco shop down the street. And he said, I ordered a jalapeno popper, cream cheese stuffed, California burrito. How do you know with that many words in the name of one food item, that should be like illegal or something? Like, you're going to be in bed for days. I mean, it just sounds crazy, right? But I was a new believer. I didn't know any better. Didn't have a lot of wisdom, you know what I'm saying? So I went right over there after class, and I bought that thing, and it was amazing, I mean, cream cheese and jalapenos and carne asada, sour cream, God's will for my life, all right? It was just, it was amazing, but it was true. I'm like, you know, I need to, like, lay down. I need to take a nap. And so I got on the freeway, and I started heading home. And as I was driving, something crazy happened, okay? My chest started closing up, and it was kind of scary. All of a sudden, I felt like I couldn't breathe very much, and my my eyes got kind of squinty, and I'm like, what's happening, right? And I thought to myself, man, I'm too young to have heartburn, and not only that, I need to get myself out of this situation. I got kind of scared. I'm like, Yo, I'm too young to go. I can't go like this. What kind of story is this? They're like, how'd he go? It was a burrito, right? It was heartburn. That's a terrible story. I don't want that legacy. And so somehow I get all the way over onto the shoulder from the fast lane. I call my friend who's a doctor. And I'm like, I'm dying. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to die. I need help. And, you know, my wife says I'm dramatic. I don't know why. It's weird. But I'm like, you know, I'm dying. And he has the nerve, this is what he says to me, he says, hey, um, how, how you been doing? What's been going on in your life? I'm like, I'm dying, did you not hear me? I'm dying, all right? Jalapenos and cream cheese, burrito, it sounds good. Stay away, all right? It's gonna hurt you. And he asked me again, he said, oh yeah, dude, I'm sorry about that, but just tell me, what's been going on in your life? I'm like, I just told, whatever. I said, well, you know, there's been a lot going on. I said, it's been pretty good. Uh, I've been going to uh, school, I'm in college, and you know, I'm taking five business classes and working 25 hours a week at the restaurant. Uh, I'm leading a ministry on campus at San Diego State. That takes me about 30 hours a week. I'm trying to plan a wedding. And yeah, except I don't really know I'm going to pay for it. I don't know um, where we're going to live after we get married. I don't feel like I have a real job. I don't know how to support my wife. Um, I'm trying to have a social life. And I live about 40 minutes away from everything. I don't really sleep. But other than that, fantastic. <laughs> like, life's great. And I'll never forget, on the phone, he just, he said, man, listen, it's not a burrito that's the problem. You're stressed out. You are full of anxiety. And that's why you're having this, this episode. That's why you're having your body do this. And I'll never forget what he said next, because it made me look at anxiety different for the rest of my life. He said this. He said, I'm glad your, your body's finally communicating to you that there's something wrong. And I'm like, are you saying you're glad I'm anxious? He's like, no, 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 I'm I'm just glad that your body's trying to tell you something needs to change. And he said, listen, anxiety's not the problem. You have a deeper problem. I want to find out what that is because I actually want to help you. And that day I learned something really important about anxiety, and it's this. Anxiety is often not the enemy. It's just the messenger. 
It's just a messenger. It's a sign that there is a problem. It's something deeper. There is an issue. It could be psychological, physical, spiritual. It could be emotional. It's just a sign. It's not the source. It's the symptom. So don't attack that. Don't shoot the source. Don't shoot the messenger. Actually deal with the issue, the fear, the true cause of what's going on in your life. Right? It, there's something uh, on the surface that you're feeling, but there's something underlying. We need to discover what that is. And maybe you haven't discovered what it is yet in your life. Maybe you're feeling anxiety, but listen, that, that's, that's a symptom of a deeper source in your life. Maybe you haven't discovered what it is yet, or maybe we haven't learned about our design yet. And for just a few minutes, I want to go Dr. Wes on you. And I'm not a medical doctor, but I've talked to several and I've done a lot of research. And here's what I found out. You have four pleasure hormones in your body. And here's the first one. Okay, it's called oxytocin. Oxytocin, it's the, it's the connection chemical. Oxytocin is the bomb. It's the most powerful all right, pleasure hormone in your body. You need it to survive. It boosts your immune system. It kickstarts your growth track. It makes you more generous. And here's the kicker about oxytocin. You cannot get it on your own. You can only get it in relationship and connection with other people. You have to get it in relationship. God made you like that. He made you for connection. You cannot do life alone. You actually need other people to survive. And in fact, I found out there's no other species in the world that's like that. And all of God's creation, a lot of animals, they, they can live on their own. Okay, even a dog, which is a very emotional animal, can live on his own. But you, you would make it. A dog would be tougher than you. We actually need each other produces oxytocin. Here's the second one. It's called serotonin. Serotonin, it's the compassion chemical. That's what one psychologist, psychologist called it uh, in an article that I read, the compassion chemical, right? Because it gets released most often when something positive happens, not to you, but to somebody else, okay? When something positive happens to somebody else. That's why we love serving people, right? That's why we like helping people out. That's why often people say, yeah, I want to serve them and I hope it helped them, but man, it really helped me. It, it changed me. And I hear that a lot when people go on missions trips, like, man, I hope the mission, like, helped, but, man, my life was changed. Why? Because we actually helped other people. It grew us. It made us feel good. This is the reason why some people who don't even believe in God, they do acts of goodwill. They give to charity. They do community service. Why? Because we're created like that. We're created to do that. That's why around here at church we say, hey, we don't ask you to serve the church to grow the church. We ask you to serve the church to grow you. It's actually good for you. God designed you like that, Right? It's why we do a lot of the things that we do. It's released when accomplishing things, not on your own, but together, together in, in, in like a group. You know, that's why sometimes you graduate college or something like that. It's not just proud for you. Your whole family's in on it. It's like a family. Thing. It's a together thing. The people you graduate next to, you're, you're proud of them. They're proud of you. It's a together thing. It releases a different kind of hormone in your body. It's a good thing. It's how God created you. This is why at our church, man, we're a couple salvations away. We've almost had 500 people decide to follow Jesus in our first couple years. And, and I say that to say what? We should all feel a sense of, yeah, we did that. Our family, we saw God do a work through us, not through one person, not through five different people. We did it as a family. That's why our church will never be about one person. It'll never be about one worship leader because you are at your best when you're not rooting and cheering on one person, but you're rooting and cheering on and celebrating the family and what we are doing together. That's when you're at your best. It's how God made you. Biologically, scientifically, neurologically, serotonin, oxytocin. You were designed for family, to be in community. Very powerful hormones from God. You need other people to get them. And the other thing is they're not addictive. In fact, oxytocin inhibits addiction. Very good for you. But there's two more hormones, and they're a little bit different. <laughs> These other two hormones we sometimes have a problem with. God made great purposes for each one, but they're very addictive, and you do not need other people to get them. You can get them on your own. They're kind of all about you. Maybe that's why they're kind of addictive. Here's the next one, the third one. They're, it's called endorphins. Endorphins is the masking chemical because it has one purpose. They mask pain, right? They mask pain. That's like when you're at home and you stub your toe. You're just walking around and boom, you ram your toe. Into the, and then you just yell something out loud, right? First thing that pops into your mind that maybe you'd never repeat in church, right? But you're in a lot of pain. You're in a lot of pain and then a few moments later, you're not in pain anymore. It's like it's totally a miracle. Where did the pain go? The pain's actually still there, 
all right? But the endorphins come and they mask it. They make you feel better for the moment. Covering pain is a blessing from God, but masking it for too long is a problem, all right? Where you never deal with the issue. Pain, just like anxiety, right? It's not the enemy. It's not the problem, but we don't like it. And so often we deal with it. We fight it. We try to treat it rather than the causer of the pain. We just treat the pain. And, and sometimes we don't get any better, right? That's the same thing with anxiety, right? And, and we don't like how it feels physically, emotionally, right? And so what do we do? We numb it. We numb it and we treat it with activities, relationships, substances, food. We attack the pain and sometimes we don't get any better. And here's the fourth one. It's, it's the last one. It's dopamine. In two different articles that I read, doctors call it the selfish chemical. It's a wonderful chemical in the sense that God made it for you to get stuff done. You get a dose of it when you accomplish something, when you win an award, when you get some kind of praise, when you get some kind of attention, when you cross something off your to-do list. I don't know if you're crazy like me, but I love crossing th things off my to-do list. In fact, sometimes I'll do a task that I know I needed to do. I'll go to my to-do list to cross it off. I'll realize I didn't even write it down. I forgot. So what do I do? I write it down just so I can cross it off. Is that crazy? Are you like me? I'm totally nuts because I want my dopamine. Nobody take it away from me. And, and so that's kind of what I do. It's dopamine. And here's the problem with that. Okay, It's very addictive. And it's all about you. The more we do it, the more you want it. The more we experience it, the more we get in our body, the more we want it. The more we go looking for it. Meaning, meaning this, scientifically, the more I make my life about myself, the more I become addicted to myself. The more I become addicted to my issues and my body and my success and what's going on in my life, my accomplishment. And I mean, know that's where the devil wants you to be, where your whole life's kind of about you as much as possible, where you can be the hero of your own story, and you can show people how successful you are, how in shape you are, how great you are, and to be seen. And as humanity, what do we do? We create systems and tools that help us do this. It's called social media. Not everybody does this. I, most of you probably don't. You're good, humble people, but we have the ability to do it. We have a tool that actually helps us become more about us, and the more we're about us, the more anxious that we're going to be. Because why? Because God designed you for family. That's how he designed even your physical body. This is why the scripture we read in 1 Peter 5, it says, it says it the way it does. It says, you see, many people in church, you know, they can quote verse 7, you know, casting all your anxieties on him. We, we can quote that, and often we can quote the famous verse in church. You, you know, it's like Jeremiah 29, 11, Romans 8, 28, John 3, 16. We know that verse, but sometimes you've got to go read the verse after it you got to read the verse before. It gets even better. It gets more challenging, right? You actually learn what, he's, what they're really saying contextually. Verse 7 is what I want, but verse 7 never happens without verse 6. That's the one I need, but it's often the one I resist. And it says this, 1 Peter 5, verse 6, humble yourselves. Humble yourselves. You want to deal with anxiety. This is the most famous scripture in the Bible on anxiety, and we know verse 7, and he says, actually, you never even get to that point until you humble yourself. Don't make it about you. In fact, that's why this is true. Attacking anxiety often begins by humbling your heart. Attacking anxiety, it often begins with you humbling your heart. And there's a couple aspects to humility. Later in the series, I want to talk about fear. Fear, we have a lot of anxiety because we have a lot of fear. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. And part of being humble is trusting God, even when you don't know what's going to happen. In fact, I'll say it like this. Humility really looks like this. It's putting what you know about God above what you don't know about your life tomorrow. It's putting what you know about God today, that he's good, that he's with you, that he's faithful. I'm going to take what I know about God today. I'm going to put it above what I don't know about my life or the world tomorrow. I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to know that God's a good God. He knows better than me. He sees the future and the past. I don't. I'm going to trust him. That takes humility. And then the other side of humility is this whole idea of not making your life about yourself. <laughs> not thinking so much about yourself. And I'll say it like this. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. All right? There's nothing God-honoring to think that, man, I'm a loser and I could never do anything. I could never accomplish anything. I could never serve anybody. That's not helpful. God didn't call you to that. He says you're more than a conqueror. He's gifted you. He's called you. He's anointed you. It's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. 
It's not thinking about you first and you wanting to be first. A lot of times we get stressed out, you know, because why? Because it's all about us. I don't know that's true for me. The most, you know, the most stressed I ever get in my life is when I need to be the star. It's when I need to have my way. It's when I need to be the MVP and be seen. And often we live in a culture that says, that's good. That's good. Find every opportunity to tell people about all the great things you're doing right now. Just brag or humble brag, which is funny. Humble brag, it doesn't really go together. That's why it's funny, because it doesn't make any sense. The Bible is saying if you don't want to be anxious, if you don't want to cast your anxieties on God and have them come back at you like a boomerang, you need to humble yourself. And I think one of the issues is, as a culture, we're losing our ability to be humble. We don't even know what it looks like anymore. It's hard. The lines are blurry, especially online and on social media between what's humble and what's confident, what's humble and what's, you know, you know, what's humble and what's prideful. And it's it just, we don't understand. We can't even see it anymore. We're losing our ability to do it. Sometimes the only humility we see in culture is hashtagged at the end of a post where somebody tells you what they just won or what they just gained or what they just did. And that's just not really humility. It's not. It's not, not when we're thinking all about ourselves. And I'll, I'll tell you, you can have a lot of anxiety in your life if you're waiting for other people to make life about you, if you're waiting for other people to do all the things you want them to do, to make you happy, as if it's all about you. And the reason you have a lot of anxiety from that is, number one, people can't read your mind, okay? But number two, people are often focused on making it about them. <laughs> They're focused on their thing. It's kind of like when you take a picture Sometimes my wife and I, we take a picture and we go to look to see how it turned out. And she says, oh man, my eyes were closed. When you take it again, I'm like, oh, I didn't even notice. Why? Because I was looking at me in the picture. And why weren't you looking at me in the picture? You said you like my shirt. Like, what's the deal? Like, a lot of times we're focused on what we're doing, what we look like, how, how we're progressing, what we have. And that's why Jesus says in Matthew 6, stop worrying about all that. Just stop how, worrying about how you look and your body and your clothes and your food. Life's more than that. I made you for family. I made you to focus on other people. I'll provide for you. I'll promote you, right, when I see fit. And that's why if you continue to read 1 Peter 5, I didn't read this section, the Bible actually says God opposes the proud and what he gives grace to the humble. And the message, he says, God's had it with the proud. He's fed up. He's had it with the proud, but he enjoys and delights in plain people. Plain people, that's nuts. Nobody's trying to be plain. They're not, you know, and you get in conversation. And people ask me, something like, why, why don't you do some more, you know, of the things that maybe another leader would do to promote yourself or social media or whatever. And, and sometimes you want to do that as a person, as a, you want people to see the good things that you're doing. You want to brag. And the reality is like, listen, God, just, just be plain. Stop trying to be special all the time. Not plain spiritually. We have a supernatural God with a Holy Spirit of power. That's what I'm talking about. I'm saying not needing to be, you know, seen and attention and be the special person all the time. It says he enjoys plain people. And I would encourage you, if you want, if you want God to enjoy you, just be plain. You know, don't need to be the center of attention, right? And, and, and so that's just what it says in 1 Peter 5. It says, listen, God opposes the proud. Okay? And it also says, if you continue reading, that uh, when it comes to promotion and exaltation, you let God do that. Let God promote you. Don't do it yourself. And I'll say it like this. Whatever you gain through self-promotion, you have to sustain. But whatever you gain through God's promotion, he'll sustain it for you. Why? Because he gave it to you. You know, it's a lot of work trying to keep up an image all the time. Trying to act successful. Trying to keep this image up that you're so happy and life's perfect or whatever. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of energy. And it's just not worth it. You don't need that. God can promote you. He's going to sustain the advancement, the growth that he gives you in your life, the opportunity. He'll sustain it if it actually came from him. And if you do it on your own, you're going to face a pressure your whole life that you're not really made to deal with. That's why we have a lot of anxiety. In fact, I'll say it like this. Because of the performance and success-driven culture we live in, we often live under a pressure to achieve that we weren't made for. You weren't made for that. That pressure, you don't need it. And it says this, when you give in to that, the Bible teaches us, anxiety is produced. When I make my life about me, anxiety is produced. And I'm here to tell you today, that's not the enemy. Anxiety itself, it's not actually the problem. It's trying to tell you that there is a problem. In fact, I'll say it like this. I think God is okay with a little bit of temporary anxiety in your life. He is. Think about it. How about before you sin? 
You know, sometimes before stepping into something we know is wrong, we feel a little anxious about it. I think God's okay with that. It's called conviction, right, from the Holy Spirit. Some of us right now, we're in sin. We're living in it. We're in the wrong relationship. We're not being pure. We're cheating somebody. We're lying to our spouse. You're in sin right now, and maybe you feel a little bit of anxiety about it. Listen, I think God's fine with that. He's hoping that the conviction diverts you into a different direction. How about after sin? How about after sin? Sometimes we feel a little bit of anxiety from the guilt and shame. And I'm here to tell you, God's not okay with that, all right? He doesn't need you to live in guilt and shame. He's actually taken your sin and removed it from you. Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west. Your sin has been removed from you. But before you approach something that's harmful to you, anxiety's produced. And I think God is okay with that. In fact, he designed you like that by putting this last chemical in your body. There's a fifth one I didn't tell you about. It's called cortisol. Cortisol. Cortisol is the anxiety chemical. And a lot of people know, hey, if that stays in your body, that's bad for you. That can be damaging. And yet I think God created you like that. Why? I'll tell you why. He created it in you to keep you alive. All right? It's, it's known as the fight or flight chemical. Okay, fight or flight. Flight or fight or fight chemical in your body. It's meant to keep you alive. It's kind of like, you know, this happened before in our house where, where it's the middle of the night, we're in bed, Monica shakes me and said, hey, I heard something downstairs. You should go check. And so I go downstairs, you know, guns blazing with my huge flashlight, and I get down there and I said, show yourself, you coward. You know, is there anybody here? And, and in like five seconds, I went from slothful deep sleep to like Rambo or something. It's just like crazy. Why? It's called cortisol. It it's comes into your body to help save you and help protect you, to, to wake you up, to get you away from danger, to keep you alive. And then what happens is, okay, there's nobody here. I go back to bed. I say, oh, it's just, you know, it's something fell or something like that. I don't know. And nothing's there. We go back to bed and we calm down. And when you calm down, cortisol is leaving your body as it should. All right? Stress is not meant to stay in your body. It's supposed to leave. It's meant not to be there for very long. Cortisol actually shuts down your immune system. It stops your growth track. It drains all your energy. And get this, oxytocin, the good one, and cortisol, their enemy. When cortisol is in your system, it stifles any release of oxytocin. Right? This is why, okay, when you're anxious, you often feel alone. Even if you're not, you feel alone. Nobody understands, nobody gets me. Why? Because it's harder to to connect with people, you don't have oxytocin. And some of us, we live in that. We live in stress. We live in anxiety. We feel alone, and it's killing us. It's killing us. A lot of people think, man, you know, sickness is on the rise. Is our medicine bad? Our medicine's amazing. It's just trying to keep up with the heightened level of anxiety and cortisol in our system. In fact, I'll say it like this, zebras, all right? Here's a picture of zebras, now, as an example, I want to give you these zebras. These zebras are just hanging out in northwest Africa. They're chilling. They're taking a selfie, all right? It's sure to get a lot of likes. That's going to give some dopamine. But imagine that as they're taking this selfie, that a lion starts running towards them in the distance. They were hanging out. They were having a good time. They were connecting. And then all of a sudden, they take off running, okay? All it takes is for one zebra to see it. Wow, cortisol, okay? cortisol, fight or flight, and then they take off running. And zebras, like many animals in the wild, they see one friend running, they don't even need to see the danger, boom, they're taking off running. All right now I'm running, what's happening? Cortisol, it's saving my life. I need to get to safety, we need to get out of here. I need to protect myself, and then once we get to safety, we can calm down, cortisol can leave, we can take another selfie together, oxytocin, maybe some dopamine, all of a sudden I feel better. But now imagine... All right, that there's a zebra who doesn't even ever see the lion. Who thinks, man, where'd all my friends go? You know, we were all hanging out and man, they just seemed like they left. In fact, that gave me a little bit of anxiety when they just took off running like that. That's weird. I know, I'll do something to make me feel better. I'm just gonna drink some of this water. I'm just gonna hang out right here. Man, I'll find a substance, a relationship, a goal, some mindless activity to do what? To, to numb. To know. Meanwhile, there's a lion right in front of you, and you're not even looking at it because you're not fighting the issue. You're actually fighting the symptom. You're fighting the anxiety, and anxiety is not the issue. And a lot of times we numb, and here's what the scripture says to that. Don't numb. Why? Here's why. Be sober-minded. 
Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Before you numb, wait. Wait. Don't numb yourself to your feelings. You're going to misdiagnose the issue in your life, and you're going to become blind to what's really going on deep down. I don't want you to miss that. I don't want you to miss it. Or don't you miss what? The fact that your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And when you're numb, you don't see it. You don't see it. And the Bible says that, man, this, this lion's cunning. He's not like your average lion. He rarely comes at you with fangs out and teeth out, and he doesn't look dangerous. He comes to you like your friend. And he says, hey, how you doing? Uh, in fact, you know what, man, I'm sorry. Anxiety stinks. I don't want you to feel that. And then here's what he's going to do. He's going to try to help you. He's going to offer you some things. Here's a relationship. Here's a substance. Here's a food. Here's an act. Here's something that can kind of just mask it. Here's anything other than Jesus. Anything, an image to uphold. And there are all these false coping mechanisms, and they don't serve your deeper issue. And here's what we all find out. We go into these things. We become addicted to stuff. We step into sin. We, we do things that are less than Jesus, and they don't fill us. And what happens? When we find out they're not good enough, they just produce more anxiety in us. Because I did all this, and even that wasn't good enough. And the issue gets deeper and deeper. And anxiety, it's not the problem. And according to scripture, the line is, listen, when we numb our anxiety, we protect our issue. When we numb the anxiety, we can protect sometimes the issues in our life. We can protect the lion. We keep it right there and we become blind to it, right? And when it stays there, the lion, it can just it can drop something nice in your front door. And you say, hey, why don't you just take some of this? Why don't you focus on this? Why don't you get in this relationship? And then as we partake, as we do that, as we accept it, he just slips in the back door of your life. And some of us right now, we have a lion in our life and maybe we don't even know it. And here's what God says to that for your spiritual life. Resist him, don't protect him. Don't be friends with him, resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Meaning what? You're not alone. Christian people have anxiety. Is that crazy? Like, it, it's true. Don't feel bad if you have it. Okay? If, you're, if you're taking a medication, if you're fighting, you don't need to feel bad. That's not the point. If that's what you heard, I'm really sorry. That's not the point. God can move supernaturally uh, through any happenstance in any moment. He can move through medicine, doctor. He can move through all of it. Okay? You don't need to feel bad for any way you're trying to treat it. Just know that you don't need to feel bad for dealing with it. Even says here, there's believers that are going through this all throughout the world. Know that you're not alone. And after you've suffered a little while, maybe after you've had a little bit of anxiety for a little while, it hits you. He's saying, I, I want to heal you. I don't want it to stay there. After you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace who's called you into his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Listen, God hopes any short-term anxiety from your struggle will lead you back to long-term awe of your Savior. I think the opposite of anxiety is awe in God. And that's not to say that you'll never have an issue again. Or, I'm not saying any of that. But a lot of times, it's in God's presence my anxiety leaves. I'm in awe of God again. And so to close the message, I just want to give you a couple applications. I got an acronym. It's AWE. Here's three. A-W-E. A-W-E. Here's the first one. All right. Attack through meditation. Attack. How do you attack my anxiety? Do it through meditation. You know, and, and what you learn in the world today is that meditation is this thing where you empty yourself to find yourself. That's not actually the complete picture of how God created meditation. It was actually God's idea. We see it in Scripture. Right, it's in Joshua 1, 8. He says, you want to be prosperous and successful. He says, meditate on the word. And so God's meditation is not just about emptying yourself. It's about emptying yourself so that you can fill yourself with God's word. You can fill yourself with his truth. And the problem is a lot of times we can't fill ourselves because we're already full of other stuff. We're full of anxiety. We're full of worry. We're full of all kinds of stuff. And we need to learn how to empty ourselves so that... We can fill ourselves with his word. And one way that really helps me is sometimes when I'm praying, I just go right to my anxiety. I mean, do you ever pray or read the Bible and you become distracted? <laughs> Does that ever happen to you? It happens to me a lot. And often we get distracted with what we're anxious about. My mind wanders to what I'm anxious about. I'm trying to praise God for him being so good. And I'm like, oh, I got that meeting later. Oh, I don't like that guy. You know, like hopefully that's not what I think. But you get anxious. 
you know, and, and your mind goes there. And I'll just say like this. In prayer, if your mind often wanders, okay, your mind often wanders, you should have to what you've been praying about in the first place. Okay, I'm going to re-say that. In, your, in prayer, your mind often wanders to what you should have been praying about in the first place. Right? You're trying to thank God, and my mind just goes off to something else. And you go, just listen, just go there in prayer. Go there in prayer. Just pray for that. God's okay. You know, you had a plan, and you went off script. Well, sometimes you can't even receive God's word. Why? Because you're full of anxiety, and you need to deal with that first. I need to empty myself. Empty myself. And if you feel like you're in a place when you're trying to pray and meet with God, and you're anxious, sometimes I just have to take off a piece of paper, and I just write at the top, what am I anxious about today? And I just start to list those things off, man. The things I'm worried about. The things I can't get out of my mind. And I'm just telling you, go there. Let it out in his presence. God's okay with that. You've got to empty yourself. You've got to let it out so that you can fill yourself with his word. And in so doing, you take inventory of what's in you. What's in you? What are you allowing in your heart? I love what David says in Psalm 139. He's stressed, he's anxious, he's got enemies all around him. He says, search me and know my heart, God. If there's anything not of you, take it out, expose it. And it's one of the greatest life skills you can learn, to take time, to take responsibility for your anxiety, the things that are in you that you don't want to be in you. And you don't need to blame anybody else. You don't need to blame the government and the world and this person. Like, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fight this. I'm gonna attack this. I'm going to examine my life. Listen, examine your life. If you don't like what's coming out, take inventory of what you're putting in because it's correlated. What am I letting in here? Okay. And then once you empty yourself, fill yourself with God's word. If you keep reading Psalm 139, David says, how precious are your thoughts for me, O God. I want to fill myself with God's word, God's thoughts for me. How vast is the sum of them? They're more than the grains of sand on the seashore. And I'll just ask you, do you want to know what they are? I do, but I can't, I can't get to them a lot because I'm full of anxiety. And so he says, empty yourself, meditate on his word, fill yourself up with the thoughts of God. When you read God's word, you often find what God's thoughts are and have been for us. But when you go into prayer in his presence, man, you, you find out what they currently are just for you. What's God thinking about just for you? What, what's he thinking about? You know, what verses are really speaking to you right now, right where you're at? And that's kind of what meditation's all about. Meditation is about making your worries face his word until victory. I love that. Making my word. You're going to face his word because his word is true and I believe it. And if you're still anxious, just keep praying it. Okay? I'm not leaving this place. I'm not leaving this meditation. You know, sometimes it takes me 25 times to think on, pray on, read a verse till I believe it. Psalm 3, you, O Lord, are a shield for me. Sometimes i got to just say that and pray that over and over again until I start to believe it. Here's the next one is W. W, worship like you mean it. Worship like you mean it. I think all too often we come into church or we do church online and we sing these songs, you know, and we sing and we're not really even meaning what we're saying. We're just kind of saying words. We don't really mean it. We're making declarations to God, we're making commitments to God, and we don't really live them out. And that's actually really harmful toward you. Actually, Dr. Caroline Leaf is a Christian neuroscientist. She says that when you come to church and you sing songs and you sing to God, you declare things about God, things that he'll do, things that you will do, and you don't really mean it. You're just singing a nice song because it sounds good. And she says this, when it, and that happens enough, your brain rewrites itself, it rewires itself to ignore what you sing from now on. You don't really believe it anymore. It's not really part of your life. It's called cognitive dissonance. You train your brain to disconnect from what you're saying. What I'm saying is good because I'm, you know, I'm in church and that's what I'm supposed to say. It's the Christian thing to say, but I don't really believe it. It's just Christian ease. It's culturally correct. It's just not really correct in my heart and in my mind and in my lifestyle. And when that happens, your brain stops believing it says it like this, we're so used to saying it and not living it, your brain subconsciously stops believing it. There's a disconnect. There's a disconnect when, you, when you're in church and you say, God, you're a way maker. You're a miracle worker. You're a promise keeper. I believe it. But then you worry all week about money. See the disconnect? It, your brain takes notice of that. And it says, okay, when you say God's a way maker, you don't really think that. You just say it because you're supposed to say it in the culture. You're supposed to say it around here, and you don't really believe it. And so here's what I've been doing just to practice against that. When I sing a song now, I try to pray it out. 
Say, God, you are here moving in this place. I worship you. I worship you. God, you're here right now. I'm not just saying, God, I believe you're right here. You're with me. You're in this place. You want to speak to me. You want to connect with me. God, you're a way maker. Oh, God, that's what you are. You're a way. You can open doors that I can't. I believe it, God. And you got to start affirming it and preaching it to yourself. And that's been helping me a lot as I focus on the words intentionally of a worship song. I worship like you mean it. You'll start to believe it. It'll change your faith. It'll change your behavior and you'll start to live it out. It'll start to affect your life. And here's the last one. It's E. It's E. Exchange stress for rest. (laughs) Exchange stress for rest. It's one of my favorite promises in the Bible. Matthew 11, 28, Jesus says, if you have stress, give it to me. Come to me and I will give you rest. Tell me that's a good deal. If God's handing that out, I will take two, I'll take three. I I want that. When you go into God's presence, you're going to know. You're going to have peace. When you enter the Father's presence, you'll know because you'll leave with more peace than when you came in. He says, if you meet with him and you don't leave with more peace, I don't know who you met with. It actually wasn't God. He says, come to me. I want to take your anxiety. I want to take your stress. I want to give you rest. I want to give you rest. And that's what I want to do as we close out this service. I want you to feel free to run to the Father's feet and know that, man, if you are stressed out, you don't need to feel bad about that. Jesus was stressed out. He was. And and if he was stressed, you know, if, if you feel bad about your anxiety, that means he should have to feel bad, and, and he doesn't. He's perfect, lived a perfect life. But the Bible says in, in Luke 22, there's a story there where Jesus goes to a place called, called Gethsemane. It's before he goes to the cross, and he sits down and he prays. And he actually asks God, he says, Lord, take this cup from me. I don't want to go to the cross. It's going to be painful. And the Bible says there that he begins to sweat like drops of blood. And and there's debate about whether or not, you know, that was actually blood or it's just sweat that was the size of blood. Doesn't matter. That only comes from one thing either way. It's stress. And he's so stressed out. And in this moment, something has to give. You know, his faith has to give or his, you know, his stress has to give. Something has to give in this moment. And he prays and he intercedes, the Bible says, all night. And in verse 44, an angel comes and strengthens him and gives him the faith to get up and keep going. And it doesn't mean he didn't have stress. It just means his faith overcame it. You see, faith isn't the absence of anxiety. It's the means to overcome it. It's to say, God, even in the middle of it, in the middle of pain, in the middle of anxiety, I'm gonna trust you. I'm gonna have faith. Will will you take my stress? I wanna take your rest. And so God, we just pray for that right now. I just pray for rest across our church family, wherever we're at. Whatever we're going through, God, this has been a crazy season. It's hit us all so differently. I just ask you, Lord, I beg you, would you come through and bring rest right now? Would we come with you to, to you right now with our anxiety, the things we don't know about, the future we're worried about, our financial problems, relationships, whatever, would we bring it to you right now in your presence? Would you give us rest? If we do have a lot of anxiety, would we know there's, there's probably something deeper there? Man, maybe I could talk to someone. I can read the word. I can, I, I, I can pray it out. Something. I don't want to ignore it, though. And that's kind of what we're talking about today. I don't want to ignore what could be underlying what's deeper than just the anxiety that I'm carrying. There's, there's something deeper there. I want to discover what that is or show us what that is in our life. I believe you want to heal us. You want to rip it out. And you can do it many different ways. You can do it through counseling. You can do it through medicine. You can do it through a radical moment. There's so many ways that you move that we see in Scripture. And so I pray, God, that you would unleash the arsenal of all that stuff for the people in our church family. I pray we'd give you anxiety. We'd fight it. We'd meditate on your word. We'd worship like we mean it. And we would come to you with our stress, and we'd receive rest. But God, I pray if there's a hard situation we're facing right now, I pray we wouldn't run from it. We'd get help. Um, We'd try to fight it. We know that, man, we don't just need to numb out. I, we actually have something there that we want to deal with, a worry, a fear, a lack of faith, a real deep issue in our life. Maybe it's a physical problem. We need to get help for that. I just pray we wouldn't ignore it, Lord. So show us what that looks like. How do we come running to your feet? And I pray that ultimately, God, this month, man, you just bring so much healing. Would you break fear? Would you break chains? Uh, would you free people? 
Well, that's what the word says. It says where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And so we pray for that. We pray freedom like never before, God. Free us from our anxieties in our life like only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I hope that you were blessed by our time together today. Don't forget that you can dive deeper into today's conversation by downloading your weekly game plan at CaptivateSD.com. We love you, church. Cannot wait to be back here with you next week in person or here online.